All right, chapter 23, let's move into the digestive system. Now, this chapter is a lot of content, but I'm going to do my best to keep this video as short and to the point as possible. Although I do want to start off by saying that there are things that will kind of seem in certain ways redundant because we're going to look at big picture functions, and then we're going to break down various parts of the functions of the digestive system. All right, let's start off by talking about the digestive system itself. So this is a system that consists of a muscular tube, which we call the GI tract. And in long form, that is the gastrointestinal tract. And we also have contained within the digestive system a variety of accessory organs. So let's look at the components here that you see on the screen. We have the component of ingestion. We have mechanical processing, chemical processing, propulsion, secretion, absorption of organic molecules, and the compaction and defecation. We'll get more into those in a little bit. There's also a video here that you can watch to take you through that in some more detail. I'd like to jump right into the functions of the digestive system in general. These functions are going to include ingestion. And basically, ingestion occurs when foods and beverages enter the digestive tract via the mouth. We also have a process called mechanical processing. And basically that is the chewing, the mixing of food with our saliva, the churning of food in our stomachs, and what we call the segmentation in our intestine. Then we have something called the propulsion. And you can see that the pharynx and the esophagus are both involved in propelling the food, as are some of the other parts of our digestive system, such as the small intestine. Basically, propulsion, therefore, is the movement of food through the alimentary canal by swallowing. And then we have something called chemical digestion, which is the chemical and enzymatic breakdown of foods into the small organic molecules that can be absorbed within our bodies. And if you think back to AMP1, we learned specifically about carbs or carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Then we have a process or another function called secretion. So the digestive system secretes by emitting water, enzymes, buffers, and acids into our lumen, which we're going to learn about. And then finally, we have a function called absorption, which is the movement of the organic end products and other important molecules from the lumen, which is within our GI tract, into the interstitial fluids or the blood or the lymph. Okay, so this chart is going to specifically break down the organs, the major functions of each organ, and then some tertiary or secondary tertiary types of functions of each organ as well. Okay, if we want to take any specific part of this digestive system and look at a very detailed level um, or layers of the tissue, we can do that. So the alimentary canal, for example, has four basic tissue layers. It has what we call the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and the serosa. And you can see those in this image here. Those terms are bolded, and then you have really a description or some subterms underneath that to describe the tissue in some more detail. The mucosa has some modifications, and you can see those in this image here. We can also get a good look at some smooth muscle. And we know that it's found, as it says in the caption, uh, around the organs in the digestive, respiratory, reproductive tracts, as well as in the eye. Okay, so here's a look at a relaxed muscle cell on our left. And then we get a look at the contracted muscle cell there on the right, and that's smooth muscle. Remember, smooth muscle is an involuntary muscle, as we learned about in AMP1. Just like all muscles, the smooth muscle is also innervated by certain nerves. Here's another look and some different views of the structure of these smooth muscle cells. There are five major peritoneal folds. And we can see that those are called the greater omentum the falciform ligament, the lesser omentum, the mesentery, and the mesocolon. All right, so the crux of our unit here that we really want to get down over the course of this chapter is the digestive processes and really understanding 
the functions and the processes. Remember, in this course, we focus a lot on physiology in addition to the anatomy. All right, so it's important that you're able to talk me through this physiology from the ingestion of the food through the defecation. Really, that is the overarching theme of our digestive system. We want to really understand those aspects. In addition to looking at this process from ingestion through defecation, it's important to know that in order to make this happen, there is a level of neural control that is constantly going on. In AMP1, we learned about the nervous system, and so you have an idea of what neural control means. Basically, in the context of the digestive system, we're referring to neural control throughout the walls of the alimentary canal, which contain a variety of sensors that are going to help regulate these digestive functions that we see in this image here. This is going to include mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors, osmoreceptors, which we'll talk about. These are all capable of detecting mechanical, chemical, and osmotic stimuli. We also have hormonal control involved in digestive processes. So here's where the endocrine system and the nervous system come into play. So a lot of times we refer to that as the neuroendocrine system. So as far as the hormones go, there's a variety of hormones that are involved in these processes. There is a main hormone. There's a main hormone, which we call gastrin. And basically gastrin is secreted by the stomach in response to the presence of food. And this gastrin is gonna stimulate secretions of what we call gastric acid. Okay, in addition to the neural control and hormonal control, we also have gravity to our advantage, working to our advantage. And you can see that the peristalsis refers to um, the food moving through the digestive tract with alternating waves of the muscle contractions of the smooth muscle and the muscle relaxations of the smooth muscle. Starting with the mouth, it's important to know that the mouth is lined with what we call non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And within the mouth is where we are going to produce the bolus, right? We masticate that food with our teeth and it's then moistened by saliva, which is secreted by the salivary glands. And then the enzymes in the saliva begin to digest the starches and fats. And then the food is turned into bolus with the help of the tongue, as we can see in the caption at the bottom. And then it is moved into the esophagus by our swallowing. Okay, in the classroom, I'll do a little more on the anatomy of the mouth. We also have to fully understand the teeth and the different names of the teeth. So we'll go over all that in class. The teeth also have a numbering system for uh, permanent teeth and a lettering system for deciduous or baby teeth. And we're going to review that in class as well. Okay, the tongue also has its own anatomy. And to get a glimpse at what that anatomy looks like, you can look at this image here. The tongue's basically composed of skeletal muscle, which is going to manipulate the food. We also know that the tongue helps us form words and it serves as a sensory organ. Okay, within our tongue, we have what we call taste receptors. And so there are specialized epithelial cells in these sensory structures. And a lot of times we'll refer to them as taste buds. We actually believe it or not have more than 10,000 taste buds when we're young. And then as an adult, we have a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less over time. And then by the age of 50, we have less than one third of the taste buds that we started with. So here is some information on the teeth. Again, we will go over this more as part of a lesson in class. It's important to also know that the types of teeth are the incisors, the canines, the molars, and the premolars. Okay, there's a look at the anatomy of a typical tooth. All right, diving back in to talk about the pharynx. This is more commonly called the throat. And it also possesses skeletal muscle tissue, and that's used for swallowing. We can divide the pharynx actually into three regions. One of the regions is called the nasopharynx. Another region is called the oropharynx. And then the third is called the laryngopharynx. So you can see those here. Then we move our way down here into the esophagus. And the esophagus is, the esophagus is a hollow muscular tube. And its function is to carry the bolus 
from the pharynx to the stomach, which is down here. So in short, the esophagus has multiple parts. There is an upper third, and that part of the esophagus is composed of skeletal muscle. It's for swallowing as well. The middle third is a mixture essentially of skeletal muscle and also smooth muscle. And then the lower third is made entirely of smooth muscle. Now there's a fancy word you're gonna see used in some of the literature, there it is. And this is pronounced, and I, I have trouble saying this myself sometimes, it's pronounced deglutition. So deglutition is the movement of the food from the oral cavity into the pharynx and then into the esophagus. So basically there are, there is three phases of deglutition, which is more commonly known as swallowing. The first phase of swallowing is the buccal phase. That phase is voluntary. All right, we control our chewing at that point. Then we have the pharyngeal phase, which is involuntary. And that's where the autonomic nervous system starts to uh, pick that information up. And then we have the esophageal phase here, and that is also an involuntary phase. So once again, the buccal phase, voluntary, pharyngeal phase, involuntary, autonomic nervous system kicks in, autonomic nervous system continues to kick in when we get to the esophageal phase. Once again, we can see the direction of food due to the factors we mentioned, the neural, logical, and the endocrine control, as well as gravity, helping the food move in the correct direction. And we can see that there is an alternating wave of smooth muscle contraction and smooth muscle relaxation. All right, now we move into another big picture theme and that is our understanding of the stomach. So we started off talking about the upper GI tract and now we're gonna be moving into the lower GI tract. So in other words, the mouth, the pharynx and the esophagus are all considered upper GI tract and that's really important to know for quizzes and or exams. And then the stomach on down is considered the lower gastrointestinal or GI tract. Okay, so we can see that the lower GI consists of the stomach, the small intestine and the large intestine. Here's a look at the tissues of the stomach. Definitely takes some time to look at that, to try to get a sense of and understand some of that information. Then we move to the small intestine. So here's where you're really gonna have to know the anatomy as well as the physiology we've been discussing. All this stuff is fair game that we've seen on this PowerPoint. As long as it's on a lab addendum, it can appear on a lab practical. So the small intestine here is where the nutrients are absorbed. So essentially, this is a specialized area of the digestive system that is specialized for the maximum absorption of these nutrients. So the small intestine is going to receive the chyme from the stomach, and it's going to serve as the site for the majority of the digestion and the absorption. So we have what's called the duodenum, and that's the upper region of the small intestine. We have the jejunum and the ileum, which consists of the middle portion and lower portion. And that's where the continued chemical digestion and absorption occurs. And here's a closer look at the absorptive surfaces of the small intestine. So with a specific look at the tissues. Now, this is a really interesting concept. It can definitely be something that appears in an exam or even as an extra credit question. And that is the concept of the phases of gastric secretion. So we know that the nervous system and the endocrine system collaborate within the digestive system, and that enables the digestive system to control gastric secretions. We can divide this gastric activity into three phases of digestion. And we refer to those as the cephalic phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. So here you can see in the cephalic phase, the stomach responds to the mere sight or smell or taste or thought of food. 
So due to that, about 20% of the total acid secretions actually occur before food even enters the stomach. So we have a variety of sensory inputs which converge on the hypothalamus. So that information is being picked up by receptors, specifically taste and smell receptors. That information is being brought to the central nervous system via the afferent fibers and the hypothalamus receives that information and induces the responses needed for preparing the GI tract for food processing. So at that point, some signals are gonna be relayed to the medulla, which in turn is going to activate the vagus nerve to start to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system response, which is gonna in turn stimulate gastric secretion. So then we have the gastric phase itself, which is about 50 or 60% of the total gastric acid secretion that's occurring, and it occurs at this phase. This is the period in which the swallowed food or partially digested protein is going to activate the gastric activity. And then finally, the intestinal phase is about 5 to 10% of the gastric secretion, which occurs during this phase. And at this stage, the duodenum responds to the arriving chyme and moderates the gastric activity through the hormones of the endocrine system and through the nerve impulses of the nervous system. So at this stage, the duodenum of the small intestine is going to initially enhance the gastric secretion, and then it's going to start to inhibit it. So those folks are the phases of gastric secretion. I mentioned the word segmentation earlier in the lecture, and since it's probably, this is probably the first time we're hearing this word, it's important for you to know that segmentations refer to the separations of chyme and then the pushing of it back together to provide time for digestion and absorption. All right, as we continue through the lower gastrointestinal GI tract, we now move to the large intestine. And this is where fecal material is stored and concentrated. Another word for the large intestine is the large bowel. And in length, it's an average of about five feet. Now the large intestine has some major functions. It's responsible for resorbing the water and compacting the intestinal contents into feces. It's responsible for absorbing the important vitamins that are produced by our bodies. And it's also responsible for the storage of fecal material prior to the last stage of the digestive system, which we know of as defecation. All right, and look at some of the tissue of the large intestine. So now we've viewed the digestive system from the entry point of the mouth. And the ingestion of food all the way down through the upper gastrointestinal tract and then the lower gastrointestinal tract, all the way through the step of defecation. Once again, please be able to describe that process for me from start to finish. Now we look at the accessory organs. We've looked at the entire elementary canal, now moving into the accessory organs at this point, and those are the salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So let's start with the liver and the gallbladder, two middle items here. The liver is the largest internal organ in the body, and it's responsible for the production of bile. Uh, gallbladder is responsible for storing and concentrating the bile until it's needed by the small intestine. The salivary glands, as we know, sec uh, secrete saliva. And then the pancreas secretes pancreatic juice, which contain buffers and enzymes formed by the exocrine cells. All of these accessory organs are vital to the digestive system. You can see here where the major salivary glands are located outside of the oral mucosa, as it says in the caption. And they're responsible for delivering saliva into the mouth through the ducts. Here's a close look at the tissues of the liver. 
and shows how the liver receives the oxygenated blood from the arteries and nutrient-rich deoxygenated blood from the veins. And here's a close-up look at the anatomy of the gallbladder. Then this goes into a little more detail about the processes of digestion and absorption as they relate to the chemical digestion that occurs within our bodies. And a little more detail on the digestive secretions and the absorption of water. And a little bit of a flow chart to bring in carbs and the carbohydrate digestion. And here's a picture to show the processes involved in the digestion of proteins, along with a chart. And then finally, the absorption of the lipids. Now, the concluding component of the digestive system unit is for us to look at various pathologies involved in the digestive tract. So looking at pathologies, we have a broad array of different pathologies here most of which you may not really know too much about. There's definitely gonna be a handful from this list that you've heard of and probably have knowledge of. So let's start from the top here with dental caries, right? So that is essentially the erosion in the enamel of our teeth, which can lead to cavities. Tooth decay generally results from the action of bacteria that normally inhabit the mouth. So these dental plaques are the first sign of bacteria. We then have gingivitis, which is an itis condition. We know itis, I-T-I-S, means inflammation. So gingiva is, refers to our gums. So it's the inflammation of our gums, usually caused by a bacterial infection. Then we have halostosis, which is a fancy name for bad breath. Once again, it's usually caused by a bacteria. Next on the list, we have mumps, which are essentially swollen parotid glands as a result of a virus, which we're not going to get too much into in this course. It's not a viro virology course, but know that mumps are, uh, have to do with swollen glands that result from a virus. Then we have a hiatal hernia. So this is a hernia of a portion of the stomach. Sometimes it's a loop of the small intestine. And essentially in the hiatal hernia, in that pathology, it's getting caught in the esophageal hiatus, hence the name hiatal hernia. Then we have, let's see, acid reflux and or GERD. And so acid reflux is the failure of one of our splinter muscles to prevent the backflow of stomach acid into the esophagus. We have a built-in splinter muscle to prevent that backflow. But when that splinter muscle is not functioning properly, we have what's called heartburn, also known as acid reflux. If it becomes chronic, we then refer to it as GERD. So GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, then we have some others here. And I'm not gonna get into every single one of these, but I am gonna highlight most. Next, I'm going to go to cirrhosis, and that's a chronic inflammation of the liver, which can actually lead to scarring of the liver. Then we have gallstones, which is essentially concentrated cholesterol derivatives that are in our bile. And if these get so large that they block the bile ducts, they could actually damage the walls of the gallbladder. We have jaundice, which is the accumulation of bilirubin, in the skin as a result of some sort of blockage or liver disease. I wanna jump down here to diarrhea, which we know of as a watery stool, which is often caused by rapid movement of the, flu of the food through our digestive tract, causing the watery stool. Then we have constipation, which is basically a difficult to pass stool. It's typically due to slow movement through the digestive tract. And that's often a result of the person not taking in enough fiber. So once again, diarrhea is a rapid movement of food through the digestive tract. Constipation is a slow movement through the digestive tract. Then we have diverticulitis, another itis condition. So that's an inflammation 
uh, in the wall of the large intestine, sometimes we refer to that as a herniation or an inflamed herniation in the wall of the large intestine. Again, that's called diverticulitis. And then finally, we have appendicitis, which is the inflammation of the appendix. And that concludes our chapter 23 lecture on the digestive system. Please let me know if you have any questions.